Aperon started in 2003. That makes this the 17th Aperon. Uh, this year we have presentations from over 110 students in 20 departments or schools. I'm Bruce Meckley, I'm Professor of Computer Information Sciences and one of the co-chairs of the Aperon. I'm basically just a temp. Courtney Sullivan from the Modern Languages Department is our real chair. Uh, and she's given us great leadership. So Courtney, can you stand up and be recognized? <laughs> this event is sponsored by many units around campus. I'd like to recognize the financial support of the School of Applied Studies, School of Business, College of Arts and Sciences, Friends of the Maybe Library, School of Nursing, Office of Student Life, and the Washburn University Foundation. Uh, volunteer support is provided by Alpha Lambda, Mortarboard, University Relations, and the Office of the Vice President for Academic Affairs. Uh, please join me in a round of applause for our generous supporters. An event like this takes a lot of planning. You need to advertise the event to students, collect their titles and abstracts, obtain approvals from mentors and chairs, organize and schedule the presentations, edit and print the program, choose a menu and order the food. These are just some of the tasks we do each year. Uh, if you're a member of the Aperon Committee, please stand up and be recognized. I'd especially like to thank Chris Rhodes from the College of Arts and Sciences Dean's Office who takes care of many of the details, making the chair's job easier. Chris is at the, uh, the uh, welcome table out in the hall. Uh, this event would not be possible without the faculty mentors. The Aperon features work that is well above the level of a typical class project. I would not be exaggerating to say many of them qualify as original research projects or creative activities that could compete favorably at conferences, competitions, and exhibitions across the country. In fact, many of them will be presented at discipline-specific conferences. In short, they represent the very best of what Washburn has to offer and we should be very proud of what Washburn students can accomplish. If you're a faculty member of a student presenting at Aperon this year, please stand up and be recognized. <laughs> and finally, the students, this is your day. The time has come for you to show your work uh, to the world and be recognized for it. If you're a student presenting at Aperon this year, please stand up and be recognized. Yeah. Now I'd like to introduce Rob Kofelt. Rob is our resident graphic artist from UMAPS um, and is also a member of the Aperon Committee. Uh, each year we have a competition among our students to come up with two posters. One is used for advertising for the registration. The other is used as a cover of our program. I'll let Rob introduce this year's winners and present them with their honorarium. I had the pleasure this year to uh, manage the uh, contest for our Aperon flyer and cover contest, and I'd like to announce our winner for our flyer is Perry Joshi. Congratulations. And our cover winner is Christina Nolan. Here we invite a retired Washburn professor uh, to give a last lecture. The last lecturer is always someone who has distinguished himself or herself through the dedication they've had to the university and its students over many years. The last lecture generously shares, shares with us transformative, transformative life lessons gleaned from years of experience. It is traditional for the last lecturer to choose a person that knows them well to introduce them. With that, I'll turn the podium over to Gary Cushenberry. Uh, Gary is a Senior Vice President of Community Relations at Core First Bank and Trust in Topeka, has served for more than, more than 30 years in the financial services industry. He has served on the boards of the Brown Foundation, Brewster Place Foundation, St. Francis Health Foundation, to name but a few. 
He's also served on the Washburn Alumni Association Board and the Ichabod Athletic Fund Board of Directors. He has been active in many, many community and civic organizations, including the Greater Topeka Chamber of Commerce, uh, Junior Achievement, Topeka Sales and Marketing Executives, and United Way of Greater Topeka. He received his associate's degree from Independence Community College in Kansas, where he played on the 1977 National Championship basketball team that was inducted into the ICC Hall of Fame in 2012. At Washburn, which he got a BA in 1980, he was the captain of the basketball team. He has two daughters, Camille and Caitlin. Uh, he's the son of Grant Ulysses Cushenberry. He will also soon be appointed to a Washburn trustee. Gary? Thank you. Uh, before, I, before I get started, I have to say I'm honored to, uh, to give the intro to my friend and mentor, uh, John Hunter. Uh, prior to, I reached out to another mentor, uh, former professor Dale Cushenberry, who was here at the Department of Education many years ago, and I asked him his thoughts on how I should intro uh, John Hunter, or how you should intro anyone. And he just gave me three bits of advice. He said, be precise, be brief, and be seated. So <laughs> with, that, uh, with that said, I am going to go into my little brief intro of John Hunter. John Hunter is a professor emeritus of the theater department. He holds an MFA from Florida State University in set and lighting design for a theater. He began his career at Washburn in 1975. I have to say, that was the year I graduated from high school. <laughs> this seems like yesterday. And for you younger folks in the room, time flies. That, uh, that was a long time ago, but before you know it, it'll be, your time will be, be long as well. Uh, in 1975, he started his uh, career here at Washburn, serving in various capacities until his retirement in 2016. Uh, during his academic career, from 1975 to 1998, John served as chair of the art theater department uh, and also established and served as chair of the mass media department. He created over 100 designs for theatrical productions during this time. He joined the Washburn Endowment Association in 1998 and served as a major gift fundraiser for the next nine years. Along with general fundraising and traveling throughout the United States, reconnecting with former Ichabods, uh, John was in charge of fundraising for the White Concert Hall renovation and the renovation of Jaeger Stadium. Uh, John has been married to the lovely Lynette Hunter for 47 years. It's a long time. Uh, John is the father of two children, Heather, who lives in Kansas City, and Ryan, who lives in Tulsa, and the grandfather of two lovely grandsons, Knox and Carl. His professional credits include lighting designs for dance companies and productions in Russia, Australia, and New York City. He also served as the, now this is quite a title, he also served as the technical director, designer for the state of Kansas International Economic and Cultural Exchange with St. Petersburg, Russia. And that was where, uh, that was where John and I kind of bonded. Um, John and I were roommates. We were in, in Russia for this production for about three weeks. And you really don't get to know someone until you sleep head to head with them for about three weeks and you're with them for 24 hours every day in a country that you don't know the language of. Um, I, I didn't realize volunteer leadership was the, uh, was the title, or else I would have included some additional things, but volunteer leadership has always been an important part of John's career. He served as vice chair of the Kansas Arts Commission Board under Governor Bill Graves, co-leader of the Topeka Performing Arts Center project, and actually that was 1987, and that was John and I's first acquaintance. We were on the uh, TPAC board together, uh, and that was quite a project. Uh, that was probably my introduction into community volunteerism. I'd always volunteered in the past through uh, through my father, but that was my first project, and that was actually the first time I had an opportunity to work with Professor Hunter. Um, he served on the design committee for the renovation of the Great Overland Station, served as chair of the Quality of Life Foundation for the Heartland Visioning Process, co-founder uh, and developer of the Nodal Arts District, 
and currently serving as the volunteer theater consultant for the Jayhawk Theater Project, while also volunteering on the various Momentum 22 committees, including the Riverfront Development with the local Topeka Chamber. John finished his working career as Executive Director of the Heartland Visioning. Professor Hunter is a recipient of the following recognitions. The James McKenna Award, presented in Ireland at the Gerald Manley Hopkins International Poetry Festival. Uh, he was a, a leader, uh, he, he received the Leader and Full Community Award, presented by the Kansas Leadership Forum. He received the Distinguished Kansas of the Year for Business Award, Arts Leadership Award, presented by the United Way of Topeka, Service to Mankind, Mankind Award, presented by the Sertoma Organization, and Sales and Marketing Executive of the Year Award. And in the words of John's wife, Lynette, that's enough already. Um, <laughs> but without much further ado, I'm going to introduce you to my friend and mentor, John Hunter. I don't know, you, you hear that type of information, you begin to wonder, who is that person? You know, did, did you do all of that? Or, and uh, indeed, I did, and it was, uh, it's been exciting. So my topic today is to speak with you about um, volunteer leadership in your community. Can you hear me all right? I, I still have my lecture voice uh, with me, is that okay? Good, good. good. Um, I'd like to start by thanking my good friend Gary Cushenberry. Uh, there are many stories he could have told you about that time in Russia, thank goodness he didn't. <laughs> Um, and he stepped in at the last minute for uh, Dr. Farley, who had originally agreed to do it, uh, but uh, uh, Dr. Farley had to go out of town. Also, I'd like to thank the members of the committee for giving me this opportunity to speak today, and to all the students who participate in this wonderful, wonderful Aprion event, my sincere congratulations to all of you. Well, if this is my last lecture, I need to do what I normally did when I lectured. And that is, I'm going to ask you some questions, give you some information, and tell you a few stories along the way that I hope you enjoy. So here's a couple of questions. So how many of you have volunteered in church, social groups, neighborhood groups? You can raise your hand, but I'm not going to call on you. How many of you have done some volunteering already? Well, that's true. Look, hold your hands up for a second. Look around the room. This is wonderful. This, this is really, truly exciting. So how many of you have held leadership positions while associated with volunteerism. Some le also, fantastic, I'm very excited about that. Lastly, how many of you have been involved in project leadership that has required many, many years of your participation? Look around the room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's see if we can get this started then. Uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics conducts a study on volunteerism in the U.S. every year. And the latest statistics come from 2015. And they show that 62.6 million Americans volunteered. 24.9 of Americans over 16 years of age volunteered. The medium number of volunteer hours is 52 per year. It's about an hour per week. 33% volunteered with religious organizations, followed by 25% in education and youth service organizations. Now, you might think that people who are retired, like me, um, that we have all the time in the world, but actually studies have found that people in the ages of 35 to 44 were the most likely to volunteer. I've been very fortunate throughout my career to be in large scale, to be involved in large scale voluntary community leadership projects. So as I move through my presentation this afternoon, I'll be using some of my personal experiences that I hope you'll find educational and interesting. And let me add, when I moved to Topeka in 1975 and I began teaching here at Washburn, I had no way of knowing my career would turn out the way it did. But it did, and I'm very grateful for that. To begin with, it is my position that not only are these efforts important for the community, but the rewards they bring to your career and to you personally are immeasurable. Community volunteer work has proven to be a powerful predictor 
in student academic lives and college experience as a whole. Studies have shown that students who participate in community service as part of their college course of study have a much higher correlation of completing their degree. In addition, college students who participate in community volunteer projects as part of their college experience report finding a much greater relevance in their academic studies after completing their community volunteer projects. And according to the National University Health Services, studies have found that volunteering can positively impact on a student's overall mental and emotional health. Saying this, let me focus today on my main points, my last lecture, by exploring what I think are three important attributes associated with large-scale voluntary community leadership projects the benefit they bring to the community, and the personal level of satisfaction derived from their, your participation. The value of making professional contacts, the value of partnerships and collaborations, and the value of improvement to the quality of life and place. Large-scale volunteer leadership is not for everyone. Some years ago, I was involved in the Gallup Strength Finders exercise. The result of that testing showed that my strengths are, I'm a maximizer, I'm a futurist, I'm an arranger, I'm a learner, and I'm strategic. Now, these are not easy traits to carry into retirement, let me tell you. <laughs> um, however, they work quite well for project development. Large-scale project leadership takes time. For me, the development of the Topeka Performing Arts Center, known as TPAC, my first project, that is now 30 years ago, it took eight years of my life. This is what it looked like when we first started the project. A great big flat floor basketball arena with a stage at the end. At the end of four years of renovation, it looked like this a beautiful performance hall seating 2400 bringing in broadway road shows headline entertainers how many of you people have been to tpac again you oh great that's wonderful i love it the tpac project was followed by four years at the great overland station how many of you have been over to the great overland station for some things again great that was followed by six years of working on the North Topeka Arts District, known as NOTO. The floodwaters of the 1951 flood that came up to the top of those windows that you see in what is now the NOTO Arts Center, and it used to be the NOTO Post Office. So look at the extents uh, of that flood and think about being on a street where the water was as high as those windows. How many of you have been over there for a First Friday Art Walk. Hope you enjoyed yourself. Five years on river development, riverfront development, historic Oregon Trail Park. How many of you have even heard of that? The riverfront and the historic park, great. Seven years and counting with the ongoing development within the dynamic core of our community. Through my volunteering with Heartland Visioning and now Momentum 2022. How many of you heard of Heartland Visioning and Momentum 2022? You're getting your exercise, aren't you? That's great. I'm glad to see that. And currently, I'm involved with the Jayhawk Theater renovation. I'm serving as the volunteer theater consultant. I'm anticipating that project will consume the next four to five years of my life. Looking around the room, how many of you are old enough to say you've even seen a movie at the Jayhawk Theater? Oh, that's great, that's great. So, I mean, they stopped doing movies some time ago, but they're still doing performances and activities in there. So, I hope you've had a chance. So, basically, right now, the way that looks, they're still doing events in it. And that's, that's exciting to be there when you know that that's going to all be changed. These types of projects take time away from your home, your family. It may cost you financially through contributions that you make to the projects, or non-reimbursed expenses that just simply absorb. Whatever the conditions associated with the effort, the rewards go far beyond the satisfaction that comes with your everyday life and work. 
So let's talk about those values of the professional contacts that we make. I worked here at Washburn, but I immersed myself in the Topeka community. Starting back in the 80s, I entered the world of politicians. I met with the mayor, city council, county commissioners, corporate CEOs, bank presidents, head of the Chamber of Commerce, even the president of a university, people of influence, the movers, the shakers in our community. Heartland Visioning encouraged my involvement with people throughout the community, working with groups like law enforcement, social services, health care, recreation, the arts, city planning, neighborhood redevelopment, and transportation. You will find that volunteer efforts also have a ripple effect, those serendipitous opportunities that you never planned on or even thought would ever happen. The professional contacts I made while working on the TPAC project led to some wonderful, wonderful life experiences. Allow me to divert for a moment and share three personal stories to illustrate my point regarding the value of the professional contacts. Uh, Gary mentioned, alluded to this a little bit. Again, not going into details, thank you very much. Um, under uh, Governor Finney, uh, she signed this uh, cultural and economic agreement with the Leningrad Oblast. Leningrad Oblast is a landmass about the size of the state of Kansas, and St. Petersburg is their major city. And as a result of that, the Russians sent over approximately 100 performers and technicians, and they toured throughout the state of Kansas. The following, that following year, Governor Finney wanted to make sure that Kansas also sent them to Russia uh, a group of performers, musicians, singers, dancers, and of course technical uh, people to put it all together. And I was asked at that time then to serve as the lighting designer and technical director for it. My good friend Gary Cushenberry was the financial uh, director for it. So there we were for weeks on end. Uh, playing in St. Petersburg and having some amazing experiences touring around the Oblast. That led directly to another wonderful, wonderful experience for me. The man who was in charge of the Russian technical crew who we met when we went over there, a man named Ivan Kondrakov, and Ivan is a man we were just emailing with this week, as a matter of fact. Ivan was working for the famous Marinsky Theater in St. Petersburg. And so on one of my trips over there, I was invited to serve as assistant lighting designer for the Marinsky. And we did Stravinsky's The Rites of Spring with the Kirov Ballet. What an amazing experience that was. And again, that happened, why? Because of my TPAC experience. The year following that, I was in Ireland giving a presentation, and when they did my introduction, like today, they mentioned the fact that I had been over in Russia and worked with the Kirov Ballet. And a gentleman came up to me afterwards and said, I must take you out to dinner. Said, okay. So the next night, I went out to dinner with the gentleman who was the, I have to look at my notes on this, he was the press attaché, press attaché, for the country of Greece who worked at the United Nations in New York City. And it just so happened that his wife was the director choreographer for the Analysis Dance Company, and they needed a lighting designer. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, for the next two years, I was leaving here on a Thursday night if I didn't have classes on a Friday. I was going to New York City, working all day with Union crews, getting the lights ready to go. Performances Friday night, Saturday, and on Sunday I was taking the red eye back, and Monday I was back in my office. But what a wonderful two years that was. Again, all of that happened in sequence as the result of uh, the TPAC project. And of course, during those years, what was nice was all of these activities, they looked pretty good on my promotion applications, <laughs> right? Lastly, one afternoon during the early stages of the development of NOTO, I received a call from an administrative assistant for the executive director of the National Endowment for the Arts. His name was Roscoe Landismut, and he wanted to know what was going on in Topeka, and could we arrange a gathering for him to attend and learn what was happening in NOTO. How he knew about NOTO, I can only guess. 
But as a result of that phone call, I spent an entire afternoon with the director for the national, the director of the National Endowment for the Arts. You can just imagine the impact on an arts guy like me. The value of professional contacts is still with me today. Years from now, I wonder what some of your stories may be. So let's talk about partnerships and collaborations. In 1830s, the French political scientist Alexei de Tocqueville frequently commented on Americans' tendency to form voluntary civil groups and associations. He was impressed by their desire to come together with their friends and neighbors to accomplish community, commercial, and personal goals. This was, he felt, an important foundation for the egalitarian and democratic society that he studied. In America today, many would agree that volunteerism is altruistic, whereby the individual or group provides services for no financial gain. Especially interesting within our capitalistic democracy, where money and power are often considered the hallmark of a successful person. Here we find an activity that is normally performed out of the goodness of our hearts, or simply to improve the general quality of life without any direct benefit to oneself. And in many cases, it's those indirect benefits that matter the most. During the startup years at NOTO, we worked directly with the executive director of the Topeka Rescue Mission, uh, Barry Feeker. How many of you know Barry? Wonderful, wonderful individual, if you ever get to know him. Anita Walgas was my co-chair on that project. We went to see Barry before making the public announcement that we were going to start NOTO. We we're going to develop the arts district over in North Topeka, which was a pretty derelict area uh, at that time. And Barry, right off the bat, sat us down and he said, I think the mission will be the biggest problem in developing this area. We were both taken aback. But I looked at him and I said, well, why don't you partner with us in this effort and turn a negative into a positive? And that was the beginning of a wonderful relationship. Over the next couple of years, the mission guests provided both volunteered and paid labor. They provided us with a truck for hauling items. They even let us use their cleaning equipment for some of our buildings. Most importantly, they provided security for the district in the early days, keeping an eye on everything that was going on. And they even picked up the garbage a couple of times a week so that the district would look clean as we went through the development. As we continued working on the development of NOTO, we realized we needed a wide variety of development assistance. So we turned to the programs at Washburn Tech. We started working with students and faculty from their various programs. Now we knew we needed skilled people to get buildings back into usable conditions, but we really didn't have the funding necessary to hire local companies. We contacted Dean Coco at Washburn Tech and began working with his staff to set up a number of quote unquote real world experience opportunities for the students. <laughs> at the height of our renovation in the district, we had electrical, plumbing, HVAC, general contracting crews working in all over the district. Working with a licensed contractor, the city allowed us to, use, to have one paid license employee working as a mentor with the faculty and students from the class. And as an example, we worked with Green Wave Electric. I don't know how many of you have heard of them. They're a wonderful company here in town. The students would basically rewire an entire floor of a building and the the uh, electric, the qualified licensed electrician and the faculty member would oversee the work that was being done and then the electrician would make the final connect into the city power. And of course we faced many, many difficulties working in buildings that were 80 to 100 years old. Some of them still had the flood mud from the 1951 flood in their basements. Uh, so you can imagine the challenges that we faced. So what does someone learn from that type of an experience? Well, you can find great value in working outside your box while still bringing your own personal expertise with you. Moving outside your comfort zone, your normal working environment, you can expand your own personal growth and development. When President Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, he spoke to all of us. No matter the title behind your name, your job description, 
or your level of wealth. Large-scale community change only happens through the formation of partnerships and collaborations of people from across the community and across all social strata. What about quality of life and place? To go beyond oneself, to be like an artist, driven to write, driven to paint, driven to construct, to create, because they have to. The satisfaction, along with the frustrations that drive these efforts, I believe are part of our humanness. Thanks to Dr. Farley, I was asked to serve as the chair of the Quality of Life Foundation for Heartland Visioning, a citywide redevelopment project. Our focus was to develop the dynamic core of our downtown, improve our community image, promote economic development, and improve the quality of life and place. Starting in 2008, over 5,000 citizens were surveyed to determine the new direction for our community. After 10 years of working on this plan, we have now moved to the next phase of development, Momentum 2022, and the formation of the Topeka, Greater Topeka Partnership. The partnership is a collaboration of Downtown Topeka Incorporated, Visit Topeka, Go Topeka, Heartland Visioning, Momentum 2022, Forge, Innovators, Entrepreneurial and Minority Business Development, and the Topeka Chamber of Commerce. So how does a group like this all work together now? Well, five years ago, we were struggling as a community because we were a community of silos, a community of silos, where every group was simply doing their own thing. Getting large-scale projects coordinated was difficult because of the self-interest of all the various groups that you see on the screen. In 2014, the Chamber sponsored a trip to Tulsa and learned about what was called the Tulsa Partnership. Make a long story short, a few years later, we hired their vice president of their chamber, Mr. Matt Pavarnik, and he became the CEO of the, of the Chamber of Commerce with the intention of bringing the Tulsa plan to Topeka. He did. And by bringing all of these groups that you see on the screen, bringing them all together under the same umbrella of the Greater Topeka Partnership, we have the coordination of all of these units working as one. Now we can get things done in a much more efficient manner. These groups also have volunteer boards that you might someday have an opportunity to serve on if you have the interest. Today, working in partnership, money has been provided for new startup companies, money for the East Topeka Learning Center, funding for NOTO projects, the downtown plaza, and much, much more. This is how we get things done in Topeka today. This is how we, through the contacts we make, the partnerships we form, working in collaboration with all entities that make up of our community, can inspire to improve the quality of our life and place. Many of you students come from towns and cities, both here in Kansas or in other states. You may not have the attachment to Topeka, but wherever you relocate after graduation, I encourage you to think about your community and how you might play a role in making that community a better place. For me, I never thought my career would turn out the way it did, nor did I ever plan on being so involved in Topeka. But now, TPAC is now 30 years old, and hopefully, if their funding campaign is successful, will provide our city with 30 more years of great entertainment. Thousands of people each year enjoy the offerings in this beautiful Art Deco facility. Here's a story that goes back to when we first renovated uh, this building. And it's one I like to tell because it has a certain sense of what I call quiet meaning uh, to me. During the renovation, remember I showed you that picture is just the flat floor arena? Well, you walk through just a couple of doors, seven foot tall doors, you walk right into the flat floor, worked your way up into the seating. But during the renovation, when we raked the floor to put the, se the seating on, um, on an angle going up, we had to change the entrance into that hall and we created the Grand Promenade. The Grand Promenade was two stories tall, so it'd be like taking out the ceiling here and going up uh, uh, to the second floor. 
And we worked for years on the design of the space with a focus on that Art Deco, the look of the original lobby area. And we wanted to car carry that design into these other spaces. So now the new promenade has a grand staircase that led up to the back level of the theater, all beautifully done in the Art Deco style. On opening night, my wife and I, and this is after four really hard years of getting this together. And I said earlier that I was on this for eight years. It was four years in renovation and another four years serving on the board uh, afterwards before I finally said enough is enough. But we're walking in and we have two elderly women walking in front of us. And they get up to these stairs. And it's the God's truth. The one turns and says to the other, now, don't these stairs look better with new carpeting on them? <laughs> so, well, we may not have improved her quality of life, but we we're very happy that she liked the new carpet. And we were even more happier by the fact that for four years, we struggled to make this whole new addition to make it look like it was all original to the project. When TPAC was developed 30 years ago, and this is almost hard for me when I, when I wrote this paragraph to go back and think about. But it was the only entertainment facility in downtown Topeka. There was not a single restaurant, not a single drinking establishment open after 5 p.m. Can you imagine having something that would draw 2,400 people downtown and they couldn't eat before a show or get a drink after the show? Look at the offerings in Topeka today. The opportunities for audiences to eat, eat before a performance or grab a bite and a drink following a show. I hope you will all have an opportunity at some point in time to experience this beautiful facility. Today on a warm first Friday evening, you'll find close to 2,000 people enjoying themselves within a two block area we all know now as NOTO. And NOTO continues to grow and change. New businesses, new artists, visitors from all over the area. In fact, uh, visitors from Missouri and Nebraska come in to enjoy this delightful district. The leaders of the Dirty Girl organization, I love that, the Dirty Girls, uh, just opened a new outfitters business and are preparing to set up a series of river float trips starting later this spring. Next month, they'll be starting on the Red Bud Plaza across from the Art Center, creating a beautiful new gateway into Noto. Oops. My last story. About three years into the development of this area, a time when we were really getting things started, people were coming over for the art walk. My wife and I were walking through the district and a young man and woman came up and introduced themselves. Turns out the young man told me, I was part of that Washburn Tech team that worked on the district. And he was there pointing out the buildings to his fiance the buildings that they did electrical work, general construction, sewer, water, and he was very proud of his accomplishments. He said he now had a job with a company that he had worked with in the district and was now planning on getting married and starting a new life. He thanked me for giving him that opportunity. For me, this meant more than any kind of financial reward. This reward you receive, and this is the reward you do receive for volunteering. The Great Overland Station, well, that still attracts many groups throughout the year. And it is going to become part of what is known as Pappin's Landing and the historic Oregon Trail Park site. It is projected to attract 50,000 visitors a year in this area. Back in 1850 to 1870, the river crossing known as Pappin's Landing had thousands of wagons, horses, cattle, and people crossing the river. Each year, just down from our downtown area, a well-used Oregon Trail, how many of you recognize that term, the Oregon Trail, came right through that area of Topeka. In those days, there weren't any levees blocking access to the river, so the wagons and the cattle and the people would just simply go right from Kansas Avenue, right down and across the river. The future park development will recognize that famous crossing and even provide a boat ramp for those dirty girls and their float trip. Downtown Topeka is changing. Land is being prepared for the new Evergy Plaza. Uh, they'll be constructing on that starting in the next couple of months. 
We now also have a new hip millennial apartment complex just opened down on First Street. It's now leasing. Our new hotel, the Cyrus, the restaurants established through private investment are all exceeding their first quarter goals. And new restaurants and housing projects are in the planning. In a recent Market Street study on downtown, it indicated we still have more opportunities for continued growth and development. And that's something to look forward to. Riverfront was actually moving along really well until we ran into a problem with the funding for the what's called the upstream weir. That project came in $2.5 million over budget. So now that project is about a year and a half behind while we go out and find some more money and, and scale down uh, the project a little bit. And it'll take time, but the benefits, once our river is open, will be immeasurable. Just look at this slide and think how great something like this will be and just happening off our downtown that will only add to the excitement. The Jayhawk Theater is in the planning stages, and the volunteer, uh, volunteer tech team, say that three times fast, that we put together is currently saving the project an estimated $130,000 because of volunteerism. This facility, when completed, will provide for movies, events, and a wide variety of performances. And you'll hear more about this project after January of 2020. So as you can see, change takes time. So putting this all together, I believe that providing volunteer leadership, you and your committee will benefit from professional contacts you make, benefit from the collaboration and partnerships you become involved in, benefit from improvements to your quality of life and place. We never accomplish projects based solely on our own merit. No matter how many leadership skills we think we possess, working together with groups of people who have different ethnicities, backgrounds, cultures, reducing stereotyping and other barriers and walls that restrict community development, your future efforts can encourage young people to remain in their communities, to live, to work, to play, your future efforts may become noticed by outside businesses and corporations that may consider relocating their offices to your community. Look at Mars Candy. Look at that wonderful, wonderful new uh, plant that we have out on the south side of town as a great example. Your future efforts may result in taking Topeka or whatever community, wherever you happen to live, to a new level of quality of life and place. Community leadership for me represents education inspiration, motivation, and mobilization. I encourage all of you, faculty, students, wherever your path may lead you, consider seeking community volunteer opportunities, either in a leadership role, as a member of a community organization, or as an independent worker. Now, don't hold back becoming involved because you don't possess knowledge or expertise about a particular project. You will learn by working with others and getting involved. Our society cannot grow and improve without your participation. Thank you. Do they have questions? Do anybody have any questions? Oh, right, I answered all of them for you? Well, that's great, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, John, for that wonderful presentation. I hope you can all attend the poster sessions. Uh, it's next door. You'll get an opportunity to speak with students about the research. And we have Polynesian cuisine. And uh, thank you for attending this year's Aperon. Courtney just reminded me that uh, John has donated his honorarium to the theater department and they will have this plaque. Uh, we update that every year. Uh, so thank you.